Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. We're continuing our intermediate series by today discussing some of the carpet pythons commonly kept in captivity uh, as, you know, the perfect next step snake. These and boa constrictors are regarded as some of the very best snakes to move on to from, say, the first snake you cut your tooth on, such as corn snakes, king snakes, milk snakes, etc. This is a jungle carpet python absolutely stunning this is a young adult girl she's absolutely fabulous soft as a brush good as gold so the species that we're going to cover in the video today are Marilia spoloita subspecies not Marilia spoloita itself Marilia spoloita spoloita is called the diamond python that is a bit more of an involved species to keep raising them for the first couple of years doesn't really pose a huge amount of problems but the problem is that they do have a tendency to just sort of drop dead and this is down to UV radiation and temperature cycling for winter they need a incredibly cool winter period which can be worrying for established boa and python keepers and it's taken a long time to get anywhere near sorted as to what we need to provide for them long term to keep them breeding and active for longer lengths of time so we're leaving that to one side also in the Morelia family, there is Morelia onopeliensis, which is the onopeli python, Morelia carinata, which is the rough scale python, Morelia bolenae, which is the boleans python. All of these, one, more than likely you're never going to come across. The boleans possibly, but you'll be paying out mega money. And with them being a montane species, these are also difficult to maintain long term. So they would be more into the advanced along with the diamonds. So we're just going to deal with the stuff that maybe we come across a bit more regularly. So uh, we're going to discuss Morelia spoloita chainae, which is the jungle carpet python. We're going to discuss Morelia spoloita harrisoni, sometimes still referred to as Morelia spoloita variegata, which is the Irian gyre carpet python. We've got uh, Morelia spoloita variegata proper, which is the Darwin carpet python. Morelia spoloita mcdowelli, which is the coastal carpet python. Uh, Morelia spoloita metcarfi, which is the inland carpet python. And Morelia spoloita imbricata, which is the southern carpet python. The last two, actually, you're not really going to come across that often. And if you do, you're probably a bit more of an invested keeper or breeder of this group anyway. So I'm not really referring too much to those. Uh, simply because if you've got them, you've paid big money for them, you know what you're doing already. So this video is more designed for the people moving on to the carpets and the ones that you're likely to come across for sale in the trade. There is another species that we're going to discuss that isn't of the Spoloita complex, and that is Morelia bredlii, or the central, centralian carpet python, or bredles python. So, carpet pythons are semi-arboreal. Um, their largest range is in Australia, and they cover most of Australia, um, and also to Irian Jaya and West Papa, uh, in the form of the Irian Jaya carpet, which is uh, Harrisoni. A lot of people don't like the use of the word Harrisoni because Raymond Hoser suggested it, who is a first class tool. Um, but it's made its way into sort of the lexicon on the forums and some of the groups I'm a member of. So, you know, we'll use Harrisoni simply because it's been generally sort of accepted um, in the wider breeding fraternity, if you like. And it's probably to differentiate it from the Darwin, which is the Variegata. So these are semi-arboreal snakes. They range from being uh, jungle, tropical, uh, humid environments to drier landscapes, uh, living on rocky escarpments or in the mouths of caves feeding on bats. So we'll discuss the subtle differences. <coughs> They're strong constrictors. They're all strong climbers. They're going to require a taller tank with some branches and logs to be able to climb and sort of laze upon. When they're younger, they coil up lovely and neat. When they're older, they, they get a bit lazier with their coiling. They tend to just sort of spread across their uh, branches and logs. They've got lovely big heads, really well defined with massive muscle structures behind the eyes. And this is because they've got to be able to take animals on the wing when they attack they'll also take the birds they'll take bats they've got the sensory heat pits all across the face and that includes on the frontal lips and the labial scales or lower labial scales which might be hard for you to pick up 
you're not going to sit still for me to be able to show them, eh? Hey, what are you like, you? So, this allows them to be able to see an infrared and be able to attack their prey. Size is variable. The small, generally accepted to be the smallest, is going to be the Darwin carp python, which is four and a half foot for males, six and a half foot for girls. Um, the largest is the coastal carpet python, which is about seven and a half foot for a boy and 10 to 11 feet for a girl. They're a considerable size snake. Um, coming in just behind that is the Bredel's python, which is separate from these other ones we're discussing, which is Morelia bredeli. The males are about six and a half feet. The girls can hit eight feet without really breaking sweat. Uh, they are strong. They are agile. They are active hunters uh, and they are interesting captives to keep. As babies, they can be a little stroppy. So you're keeping an intermediate level snake now. It's not a beginner level snake. I keep saying it, deal with it. You know, not everything is going to be born tame. You've got to sort of teach them that you're not going to hurt them. You're not going to try and eat them every time you go in the tank. And you can find that some baby carpets are very defensive. Generally, at about a year of age, a little switch goes off in their head and they realize, oh, it's only Chaz. He's not trying to eat me. He's all right him. And then we decide to get on in future. By the time they're full grown, they are lovely and tame, just fabulous snakes. And you can see the colours of this jungle are just popping, they're absolutely amazing. Um, they feed readily, they grow readily, they don't really pose a huge amount of issues in the rearing process. Um, what I would say is that certainly like the jungles, Erie and Gyres and Coastals will require higher humidity to be able to shed their skin. Um, also, they can develop respiratory infections if kept too dry. So as babies, we've got to stay on top of that, make sure they shed their skin easily. With um, adult snakes, as the skin gets thicker, the reliance on humidity reduces and it becomes less problematic. Um, what I would also say is then the Darwin and the bread lie are desert level snakes. Um, and or arid snakes and they don't require the additional humidity um, to be able to shed their skin and they're probably actually a bit easier to maintain because humidity is a complicating factor when it comes to the captive husbandry of snakes so um, the bread lie actually are fantastic they're probably for me one of the best ones because they're from such a dry region that they'll shed at nominal humidity um, they like it nice and warm, they're nice and active, they're incredibly attractive, um, they're a good size, they're impressive snakes, um, and yeah, for me, they're probably like, you know, number one. Um, closely followed by this, and this is simply for patination and colour, jungle carpet pythons are banging. There's a few different um, bloodlines out there, there was uh, Paul Harris's UK pythons, um, there's a German bloodline I've forgotten the name of which is exceptional uh, and then there was another more lighter almost white yellow which was known as the Chris Madison bloodline in the UK and this probably falls into that bracket all incredibly attractive uh, so I think that you, you should really be fine with that next step the egg layers they're gonna have maternal instincts they protect their eggs as with all pythons it's probably better to incubate the eggs yourself you'll get a better hatch rate um, most of the eggs are going to be incubated 31, 32 degrees. They'll take 65 days to hatch. Um, the babies don't really pose any huge issues when it comes to feeding and getting them started. Uh, some of the smaller stuff may require a bit of sort of chick fluff to get them going. Uh, and they're born with a decent sized yolk sac, so they might not feed for a couple of months after birth, which is perfectly fine. Um, overall, the temperatures are relatively stable at 32, 33 degrees. A cool end um, of 26 to 27. Uh, certain animals will require um, cooler winters and they'll need a deeper cycle. Australia is southern hemisphere. They do have a winter. They do have a winter cycle. So, you know, uh, the most stable temperatures are probably going to be for your Erie and Gyres and your Darwins. But when you start getting down to your jungles, uh, the southerns and inlands, they're going to need maybe a bit more of a stronger winter cooling period to be able to get the males to produce sperm, get the female to produce the follicles and the oviduct. Um, I hope you're enjoying the videos. We're going to keep them coming. Definitely consider a carpet python as that next snake. They make fabulous display animals. They really like to be out and about. They're not hidey, shy snakes. They're out, they're on branches, and they just look the nuts. Um, visit the website, which is www dot snakesnadders.co.uk 
to see what we're all about. We'll keep putting the videos out. Um, we're going to be producing a lot more through 2018. Uh, we've received a great amount of support, so thank you ever so much. We know that the videos collectively now on the standalone video guides page has reached almost 200,000, which I'm ecstatic about. So uh, thanks for the support, and I'll see you soon. Cheers, guys.